When we hear the word anxiety, most of us will instinctively cringe as we think of all the unpleasant sensations that we associate with this word. Things like our heart pounding, our breathing becoming fast and shallow, our hands starting to shake, maybe some sweatiness and feelings of nausea. And in addition, there's the racing thoughts, the crippling self-doubt, and constantly fearing the worst case scenario. Anxiety is a very normal human emotion, and we all experience it at differing degrees in response to various things. But what actually is anxiety? So anxiety is your body's natural response to a stressor, and it's a feeling of nervousness and worry about something that's coming up in the future. So the difference between anxiety and fear is that anxiety is usually in relation to a future event, such as a presentation that you have to give tomorrow, where there's more of an element of uncertainty. Whereas fear usually relates to something that's happening to you now, such as being chased by a hungry hippo in real time. So in other words, anxiety can be conceptualized as fear plus uncertainty. And this uncertainty is what perpetuates all of the what if thoughts, where we're constantly going through everything that could possibly go wrong in our heads. And whilst anxiety is a very normal human emotion, around one third of the population will experience an anxiety disorder at some stage during their lives, meaning that there is significant functional impairment as a result of their anxiety symptoms. And there are many different kinds of anxiety disorders, which are primarily categorized based on what triggers a person's anxiety, what kind of context. For example, social anxiety disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and specific phobias. And anxiety can lead to all sorts of other issues through maladaptive coping mechanisms, such as addiction, social withdrawal, obsessive behaviors, and depression, amongst other things. So why do we have this anxiety response? What's the point? So the anxiety response, also known as the stress response or the fight or flight response, is believed to have been developed back in the caveman days as a survival mechanism. So back in these days, our ancestors were constantly being exposed to survival threats, things such as vicious predators, shortages of food and resources, and severe weather conditions and temperatures. The fight or flight response was developed to best prepare our ancestors to combat these stresses through a series of physiological and hormonal responses. So what are these responses? So the components of the fight or flight response include increased heart rate and breathing rate, and this is to increase energy and oxygen levels. Adrenaline and cortisol release, also to increase energy levels. Pupil dilation to give you tunnel vision on the specific threat. Muscle tension to prime the body for action. Bodily processes such as digestion and tissue repair are poor so that the body has more energy available. Sight, hearing, and your other senses become sharper in addition to many other things, to best prepare the individual to either fight this threat, so in the case of vicious predators, this would be to attack, or to flee the situation, aka to run the hell away. There's also a freeze response, which we often experience when there's a sense of helplessness in response to a threat. So when we feel as though we're not able to tackle a stress ahead on or escape the situation, i.e. to fight or to flee, we might freeze up as a third kind of response to a stressor. So what triggers the fight or flight response? So you may have heard of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system, which work in opposition with each other when it comes to hyping the body up and then calming it back down. So the sympathetic nervous system can be thought as the activation system. And this is responsible for triggering the fight or flight response and preparing the body to combat a threat. You can kind of think of it like the gas pedal on a car. So when the amygdala, which can be thought of as the threat detection system in the brain, perceives a threat, it will send a distress signal to another brain structure called the hypothalamus. Now the hypothalamus, which is also very involved in learning and memory, is kind of like a control center, which will activate the sympathetic nervous system by triggering the release of adrenaline via the adrenal glands. This then signals for all the other physiological components of the fight or flight response to kick into gear such as increased heart rate, increased breathing rate, etc. Now, in opposition to this, the parasympathetic nervous system can be thought of as the calming system, which allows us to calm down and rest and digest food and recover. It basically undoes all of the work of the sympathetic nervous system after a stressful event by doing things like reducing your heart rate, reducing your breathing rate and inducing a state of calm. And when it comes to anxiety reduction techniques, most of these work by activating the parasympathetic nervous system, things like breathing techniques and grounding and progressive muscle relaxation. And in doing so, you're essentially pushing the brake pedal on the fight or flight response. And it's worth mentioning that all symptoms of the fight or flight response are a package deal. 
meaning that if you can calm down one of these symptoms, such as slowing down your breathing rate, all of the other components, such as heart rate, sweatiness, racing thoughts, etc., will also start to return to baseline. It's basically a physiological impossibility for your heart to be pounding a million miles an hour whilst your breathing rate is slow and controlled, unless you have a very obscure medical condition. And whilst this anxiety response was initially developed to combat survival threats, in modern times we experience this exact same stress response in relation to all threats. And this is because our brain is very bad at differentiating between perceived threats and actual threats. So in modern times, we've been shaped so that the main sources of our anxiety these days relates to social threats, i.e. the fear of other people's opinion and the prospect of social rejection. So this is why things such as public speaking and going to social events where you don't know anyone and dating and performance-based tests tend to make a lot of us very anxious. But the thing to keep in mind is that anxiety is not always a bad thing, provided that it's within our control, as this response can actually provide us with a lot of additional energy and focus. For example, most people will be far more productive at a task when there's an impending deadline in place which is fast approaching, compared to a task that's not due for ages or where there's no set completion date. And this is because anxiety associated with this deadline can increase our motivation, productivity, and focus. But on the other end, if your entire career is dependent on this task and there's no way that you're going to be able to complete it in time and you become extremely anxious, you may become overwhelmed to the point where you crash and burn and it actually impairs your performance. Anxiety is not inherently a bad thing, or a good thing either. It's completely dose-dependent. The happy place when it comes to anxiety on your level of performance is somewhere in this middle range. So the main takeaway here is that instead of seeing anxiety as the enemy and trying to fight it and make it go away, which will often just exacerbate things, a much more helpful approach is to visualize it as a tool that you can draw upon to enhance your productivity and performance when used correctly.